This is Contractor Sense with Ruth King. Welcome to Contractor Sense. Here you discover ideas, tactics, news, and information that matters to your contracting business and you. I'm your host, Ruth King. This episode is sponsored by Profitability Movement. Go to profitability-movement.mn.co to join this community of business owners focused on building profit, increasing wealth, and giving back. Thank you for joining us. Here's how we will help your business and you today. Last week, I talked about first things to do to get ready for a busy summer. They were make sure you have the inventory that you actually sold last summer so that you don't have to worry about price increases. And I talked a little bit about copper increases and making sure you have line sets too. And I talked about reactivating your inactive customers and getting those customers who have not renewed their maintenance agreements back in the fold. Today, I will discuss some cash moves for summer and a final dumb, stupid thing, in my opinion, not to do. All right, let's start with the cash. It's now to the point where cash is becoming more plentiful, and there's no reason not to put the 1% of all the cash that comes in the door in a savings account. And it's really something you can do right now because, you know, it's slower times of the year and it doesn't matter which trade you are in. Everybody pretty much has a slower time of the year. It's really hard to put that 1% away because you, oh my gosh, I got to use this. But now cash is getting more plentiful or if there's another time of the year where cash cash is really plentiful, take 1% of it, put it in a savings account. All right. You do not have to do it every single day. At the end of the week, add up your deposits, take 1% of your deposits and do an electronic transfer into your savings account. If you're not doing the deposits or you've got somebody doing the deposits for you and you're the only one who can do the electronic transfers, then you're the one who has to do that. Sometimes your bookkeepers can calculate it and you just have to make the transfers. Sometimes they can make the transfers and the deposits into the savings account. But do it. The cash is plentiful. And if you build up 10, 20, 30, 40,000 for the next slower season, you're not going to be so cash starved. Or if we have another issue come this fall when we're still not being able to get equipment and generators and condensing units and furnaces and coils and whatevers, and you have an opportunity to get what you're going to need for fall, you've got the cash to be able to do it. So no excuses. Put 1% of all the cash that comes in the door away. That's number one. Number two. Put all maintenance agreement payments in an interest-bearing savings account. And for those of you who do commercial, take 5% of the cash coming in the door for that commercial work and put it in a savings account. Again, busy time of year. Not going to hurt you. Build up the savings account. Now, let's assume that service technician goes out to Mrs. Jones's home and Mrs. Jones invests in a maintenance agreement and she writes one check. Or she gives you a credit card for everything. Yes, you have to take that maintenance agreement money out and put it in the special savings account. Likewise, if you sell a replacement system and you actually have a maintenance agreement included with that replacement system, you have to take the money for that maintenance agreement out and put it in the savings account. So let's assume you sold um, a system for $5,000. I'm just doing numbers in my head so that it will be easy and for those of you who are just visualizing and listening can and do it. And your maintenance agreement investment is $200. So the revenue that comes in is $4,800 for the system and $200 for the maintenance. All right. And that $200 goes in the savings account and deferred income. And that's how it all balances. All right. But do it. Put the money away. It's amazing how quickly it builds up. It's amazing how much you'll find a use for it and and not go to the big boys or the big girls toy store when you got a lot of money in there. But you'll find uses for it that will help you build the business. That will be an emergency rainy day fund or opportunities come to purchase materials that you can do in advance and not have to worry about supply. All right. So number one is put 1% away. Number two is to put all maintenance agreement payments, whether they're from service technicians or from installs away. For those of you who do commercial, take 5% of the cash coming in the door from that 
and put that away. Number three, make sure you get the financing paperwork signed. Now, if it's not super busy yet, this is not going to be an issue. My thing is remember to do it when it gets super busy. Sometimes the installers do it. Sometimes a salesperson goes back and does it. My my beef is when the salesperson, quote unquote, has to go back and do it because a lot of times, well, I'm too busy to get the financing paperwork. I got to go sell the next job. If Mr. and Mrs. Jones don't sign the financing paperwork, you can't get paid. All right. So if they don't sign the financing paperwork for 60 days because it's sitting on somebody's desk. Well, they just figured that you don't need the money. They don't have to pay for it for an extra 60 days and start the monthly payments unless it's a period of same as cash. And they may take another 60 days to sign it. You have to have in your pol- in your procedures how you get the paperwork, financing paperwork especially, signed so that you can get paid and the salespeople can get their commission. My rule has always been salespeople don't get their commission until you get paid. So this is a somewhat of an incentive for them to make sure that they do get the financing paperwork signed. They don't need their commission for 60 days? Fine. <laughs> don't get the financing paperwork signed. And number four, this pertains mostly for you who are doing commercial work rather than residential work. Billing. Okay. Now, a lot of times in the summer, it does get really busy or at times of the year when it gets really busy. And there needs to be overtime to make sure that the billing gets done and out. Hopefully, the service technician has a tablet. He leaves the copy of the bill with whomever the manager is or whomever he has to leave it with and gets the signatures that he needs so that billing can get be done very, very quickly. My rule, even when it's really busy, is that it's done within 48 hours. Because if you wait a week, two weeks, three weeks to get all the billing done and it's piling up, you're going, customers going, they weren't here that long. They didn't do all of that. They forget. Their systems are working fine. The employees are comfortable in in their offices again, or the people walking into the stores are comfortable or walking into the restaurants are comfortable. They forget about the pain. If you can collect it as soon as you possibly can, get the bill to them within a couple of days of the work being done, or if you can just do it where the technician leaves the bill, They'll get paid faster, number one, but there won't be the question of he wasn't there that long or that's not what happened because they have forgotten by that point. All right. So these are the four cash things to worry about, not worry about, but actually do as it gets busy for summer. Number one is to put all of your cash that comes in the door in a savings account. Number two is to put all maintenance agreement payments in an interest bearing savings account Two. For commercial, take 5% of the cash coming in. And if you need to take money from a replacement job, put that in the savings account. Number three is to get the finance paperwork signed. Number four is make sure you bill everything within 48 hours. We will be right back with one of my really favorite things of really seeing some really stupid things over the years. Thanks for listening to Contractor Sense. We'll be right back. You can't. That's what my daughter Kate told me when I said I wanted to make financials fun. The gauntlet was laid down. The red blanket was waved in front of the bowl. Ronin the rubber duck was born. This ebook is a whimsical look at financials from a duck's perspective. To get this fun, easy to read Kindle book, go to Amazon and search for Ronin the rubber duck dives into financials. That's R-O-N-A-N, the rubber duck dives into financials. Let me know if I made financials fun for you. We're back. Thanks for listening to Contractor Sense. Okay, here's the thing. Let's assume that one of your employees does something really stupid, which is a fireable offense, and it's the middle of summer. The employee may not be your best employee or might be your best employee. But in your head, you're like, oh my gosh, I need this employee. I can't afford to fire him in the middle of summer. Unfortunately, if you want your policy manuals to actually be in effect when it's busy and when it's slow, 
you have to fire the immediately fireable offenses. You have to make sure that the rules for when it's slower are the same rules when it's busy, All right? Everybody knows that this particular person has done this in the past or has gotten away with it in the past, and you might be the last person to find out. However, once you find out, you got to fire that person. True story. One of the contractors that I know has a, has a rule, there is no moonlighting. And so, gearing up for busy times, found a technician moonlighting in the company truck on company time on a weekend. Well, so it wasn't really company time, but found it on a weekend um, and talked to the customer with the technician who was still there and verified the technician was there. And it wasn't using company, you know, payment, so to speak. Anyway, they found him moonlighting. So he and another person go to the home and take the truck, fire him on the spot for moonlighting. Did it hurt? Absolutely. However, I promise you, word got around in that company that there is no moonlighting. Okay. Now, there have been times, and, and, and this is true, you know, if they ask you, can I do this for my mother? Or can I do this for my brother? Or can I do this for whatever? The answer is always yes, because they're going to do it anyway. But at least they came to you and said that they were going to do it. That's much different than sneaking around and selling a system to a customer who is using them, using, paying them directly, using your truck and your materials, and they might have gotten a deal from a supply house, all right? Not exactly a good thing to happen. And I will give you the story of another situation that happened many years ago. Service manager was not loyal to the company, and the technicians were loyal to the service manager. And I told the owner this, and he kind of ignored it. Well, right when it started getting hot, service manager and four of the technicians walked out the door to start their own company. This left the owner with the two least experienced technicians to run the calls that six technicians would have run in a busy summer. Now, two unexperienced technicians running call with where six technicians, four of which who were very experienced. Let's talk about a tough summer. Right. They had a, they talked to the customers. They let them know what was going on, and it will take longer than normal to get to them. They had training meetings every morning early so that they got better and better and better at diagnosing and fixing equipment. By the end of the summer, these two, for all intents and purposes, trainees at the beginning of the summer got trial by fire and became phenomenal technicians. Um, but it was a tough summer. So a company that had six technicians was down to two in summer. Normally what happens is a server, you know, if one of the guys is gone, everybody else picks up the slack because if you fire somebody because they needed to be fired, everybody else knew it and they're rallying around you to make sure that you take care of your customers and the people who write your paychecks. So moral of the story, if there's a moral, is that if it's the right thing to do to fire somebody when it's slow, it's got to be the right thing to do to fire that same person when it's busy, even if it hurts more with the ability to take care of your customers. So those are the two major areas of things to do to get ready for summer. Make sure that you uh, look at your inventory, figure out what you're going to use this summer, buy what you can now so that you're prepared and don't have to disappoint a customer because you don't have the equipment. Number two is to make sure that you call all of your maintenance agreement clients who have not renewed their agreement and get them back in the fold and reactivate those inactive customers at the same time. And then the cash procedures we talked about this time, 1% of cash that comes in the door in the savings account, maintenance agreement payments in a savings account, 5% of commercial cash that comes in the door. Make sure you get your financing paperwork signed. Please make sure that you bill within 48 hours for those of you who do commercial work. 
And please, if an employee needs to be fired and should be fired when it's slow, fire the employee when it's busy too. Don't let it being hot or cold or whatever be your excuse for not firing them. You will blow the policy and people will know that they can get away with things. So thank you for joining us. Choose one thing that you discovered and implement it in your business. These ideas, tactics, and strategies help you make more money, have more free time, and give back. If you like today's program, spread the word. Please review this podcast on any device you're listening to it on. Help a fellow contractor make more money too. For comments or questions, call me at 770-729-0258 or email ruthking at hvacchannel.tv. Thanks for listening. Have a great and profitable day.